Welcome to Reclaiming Home, a podcast focused on delivering thoughtful conversation and tangible actions to make housing justice a reality in our communities. I'm your host, Asale Sol Young, Executive Director of Urban Homeworks and educator, activist, and proud Turtle Papa. I'm a Black Legacy native of Evanston, Illinois, and a proud descendant of Haitians and rural Black and Indigenous North Carolinians. Join me as we take time each month to dive into all things housing, including potential policies, community dreams, persistent systemic barriers. We'll also celebrate success and everything in between. We are so glad you're here. Welcome to Reclaiming Home, Housing Justice with Urban Homeworks. I am joined today by Aisha Chugtai. So excited to have her on City Council Representative from Ward 10. Um, and I'd love for you to kick off an introduction to yourself. Give us your full name, preferred pronouns. And if I screwed that up, I apologize because I just dove into naming that um and then how you ended up in justice work awesome um thank you for having me my name is Aisha Chuktai. I um am the council member for Ward 10 on the Minneapolis City Council my pronouns are she her um I ended up in justice work through the immigrants rights labor and um housing justice movements um yeah awesome Thank you so much. And uh, for those of you that meet, might be newer to the podcast, my name is Asale Sol, and I'm the executive director of Urban Homeworks. My preferred pronouns are they, them. Uh, and if you're new also to Urban Homeworks, we are a 28-year housing justice uh, nonprofit leading the fight for housing justice so that all people have a safe, stable, and dignified place to live. This is something we are very passionate about. Um, if you are a consistent follower or listener of either our YouTube channel or our podcast, I encourage you to become a monthly contributor uh, to help us sustain this work. You can do so at urbanhomeworks.org forward slash donate dash monthly. Let's get into it. So as everybody knows, today we are talking about rent stabilization. Um, and I'd love, Aisha, if you could just start by sharing your experience uh, with rent stabilization from the city council perspective. Yep. Um, so the work on rent stabilization at, at City Hall um, predates me, started back in 2019. Um, I started at City Hall in January 2022 after I was elected. Um, and at the beginning of my my term, we we the city council created the rent stabilization work group, um, which was made up of residents and um, and key stakeholders um, on this issue in the in the Minneapolis market to give the city council recommendations on what the best policy for um, Minneapolis could look like. This came right after voters approved ballot question three in November, 2021. That's right. Um, so uh, you, are, you are a member of the rent stabilization work group. Um, this work group started meeting in the fall of 2022, met for a number of months. Um, I think I attended most meetings of the work group and got to um, have uh, like a um, a really good perspective on the types of conversations y'all were having and the um, the issues that you were wrestling with. Um, at the conclusion of your work, you presented um, a recommendation to us, uh, approved by fifty six percent of work group members, um, to to pass um, what what is referred to as, as framework five, a strong rent stabilization policy that um, would ensure renters are able to stay in the homes and in the communities they love, that we prevent displacement uh, of our most marginalized people, and that we um, do something meaningful to address the, um, the, the severity of rent increases that 
um, people of color, young people, um, and immigrant residents in this um, in in Minneapolis face. Um, that included, you know, a three percent cap on on rents year to year. Um, it included um, no um, carve out for new construction um, and uh, capital improvement and deferred maintenance um, exemption, so that um, we we could preserve affordability, um, right. or we could preserve affordable units in our community um, and make sure that people have um, have both affordable and dignified housing. Yes. Um, and uh, you also recommended to us vacancy control, meaning that rent, that, that cap is attached to the unit and not to you as a renter. Yes. Um, so uh, from there, um, our our council really um, spent a number of months in a, in a holding pattern, waiting for staff to analyze, um, waiting for an outside uh, group to analyze your your recommendation. Um, a number of months later, um, we, uh, meaning me, council mem member Osman, um, and our colleagues, decided to um, introduce your recommendation. Um, which is the commitment we made to you at the beginning of this process um, as uh, as an ordinance. Mm -hmm. And um, this process continued for the next several months um, until it came to an end um, at the end of June when uh, the, the city council voted against um, exploring the policy or conducting a public hearing. That's right. Thank you so much for that. That was an incredibly thorough recap. Um, I know our audience will really benefit <laughs> from hearing. So I do really appreciate that. Can you um, share your perspective on the working group? Why a working group? How did you think about what came out of the working group? Like just kind of break that down. Yeah, I think um, my hope for uh, a working group and, and I'm somebody who really um, wanted the council to deliberate on a policy. I understood that at the end of the day, there are two different kind of theories around, around rent stabilization. And as policymakers, we should just, um, we should just do the work and figure it out ourselves through our legislative process. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't the, the will of the majority of the body. They really did uh, want to create a, a work group and we all voted for it at, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and the the intent was to uh, gather subject matter experts within Minneapolis to study this policy and recommend something that worked for Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I think there are some um, colleagues who maybe hoped that the the working group would um, present them with a policy option that um, that didn't feel too scary, didn't feel too radical, didn't um, didn't go too far, mm -hmm. and um, and I think the beauty of the working group is is like you you all were you were all were and are subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. You do know this market mm -hmm. um, in your own unique ways better than than anyone else does, and um, and you landed on the policy that works best for Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, thank you for that, and. You know, when you when you all received the recommendation, was the understanding that the recommendation was what needed to be put forward? Was the understanding that, oh, this is this is a recommendation, so we can amend, we can edit, we can bring our own input from our expertise of listening to our constituents, mm. right? Like how were you all receiving that recommendation? Um I think that changed over time, right? Okay. When when we created the work group, you could go back and watch the meetings and you'll hear um, every policymaker say like, oh yeah, we're gonna take this recommendation. We're gonna move it through the legislative process. Mm -hmm. We're gonna um, we're gonna finalize and make make little tweaks and um, and put this policy on the ballot for voters to decide. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think one, there was a, a misunderstanding about, um, about 
what recommendation came out of the work group um, that was intentional, right? Um, there are there are a number of people who were on the rent stabilization work group who were um, vocal critics of rent stabilization in the first place, have been for a long time, mm-hmm. um, spent money defeating uh, ballot question three um, or attempting to defeat ballot question three. Um, and I think they benefited from misconstruing what happened within the work group, mm-hmm. that they benefited from um, spreading this, this incorrect um, narrative, I guess, that that the work group um, made two recommendations they mm-hmm. didn't. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, um, I think as we, but when when council member Osman and I were discussing what policy we wanted to um, move start moving through the legislative process, our intent was, okay, well, we told this work group, we said to the public, we would take their recommendation, we would move, move it through the legislative process. That's a starting point, mm-hmm. right? And if um, if members feel really strongly about specific types of changes they want to see, that's what our legislative process is for. That's what amendments are for. And we'll see that happen. And um, I think it's unfortunate, but that isn't um, that isn't where members wanted to go. Right. Do you have a sense of why? Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I think, I think it's different for each person. Um, but my my interpretation mm-hmm. um, is like it's a combination of people who just inherently don't believe in rent stabilization at all, inherently believe that it is a bad thing um, to people that um, didn't like framework five, didn't like a strong policy, but didn't know what they wanted either, mm-hmm. right? Like, it was a no to this, but not like no to this, but I can move on this or I can get to this or have you considered making this tweak or, or that specific change? It was just like, a, I don't want this, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's really fair and, and honest and I appreciate that. Um, I'm you know really interested in understanding from a city council perspective, we are well known as a predominantly renter city, 53, 52, 53% renters. Um, the working group came out with a uh, policy recommendation that was a 56% majority. In my mind, that is a very clear yep. majority. Um, and, you know, and then there's obviously the commitment that city council made back in November of 2021, where the people said a similar majority, I think it was a 53% majority said that we wanted to see a a rent stabilization policy on an upcoming ballot. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I take all of that in and I'm thinking about democratic processes and um, the the reality of being a republic, like you all represent us. We are essentially your bosses. Um, And so regardless of people's individual perspectives on Mm -hmm. rent stabilization, I'm just really wanting to get at what is the root of city council members really feeling like I want to contend with the ask of the people that voted for me. I want to really say, I'm actually going to say no to the thing that they're expecting me to accomplish. And again, I'm asking because I wasn't in the room. And in those rooms, so I'm curious, like what kind of rose to the surface around people feeling, in my mind, an audacity (laughs) to say no to the people that elected them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I often reflect on how ballot question three passed with a greater margin than ballot question one did, but the city count or but the city as an institution chose to prioritize the implementation of ballot question one before mm-hmm. three mm-hmm. um that more people voted for uh ballot question three than the amount of first choice votes that mayor fry got yeah. um and for for my constituents where uh 80 of them are renters um we have the second highest density of renters in the city um it, it this is 
this is just an expectation that my constituents had that I work on this. Um, and, and I'm not the only person um, that, that had um, residents that indicated that. Um, I think audacity, audacity is a really good way of putting it, right? And I think that audacity uh, is like, is deeply rooted in fear, you mm -hmm. know, fear of what happened in St. Paul, um, fear that, um, that Minneapolis, um, is going to stop being, um, an attractive place for the wealthy to develop and exploit, mm -hmm. um, fear that, um, fear. I, I really appreciate you naming that because that has been my perspective uh, on this entire thing mm -hmm. um, from the beginning. Whenever I hear uh, arguments against rent stabilization, they're based on this idea, mm -hmm. this possibility that rent stabilization, any kind of rent stabilization really, but anything that is prioritizing renters mm -hmm. specifically will stop development. Um, and I think even what's interesting about St. Paul is that both, uh, so Kira did a study, I want to say, um, the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs did a study, I think in 21, uh, before the ballot measure in St. Paul, that clearly stated that rent stabilization policy would not in and of itself halt or slow development. Um, HUD also has data that shows that um, when people blame rent stabilization for St. Paul's slowing development, that that's mm -hmm. actually not true, right. that the development started to slow before, almost a year before right. the ballot measure. Mm -hmm. um, and so fear is the only thing that I can think of. Yeah. It's as, like the only logical conclusion. Yes. Um, there's also recently been um, a group of economists who and economists, I feel like, are kind of driving this thing, right? Yeah. Like, where yeah, they're yeah. like, well, if you all do this, then the economy is going to go crazy, right? Yeah. But, but recently, there's been a small group of economists that are willing to say, actually, um, there's more similarity in our assumptions around what, what could happen with rent stabilization with what we thought could happen with raising the minimum wage. Yep. But that actually on the ground, the data is saying that that is not a real fear. Like it is not a legitimate fear. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and so it just feels really important to highlight that because I often think about what kind of information a city council getting? Because again, we're not in those rooms. Yeah. Uh, what kind of education do you all get? I understand that you all have a million decisions to make. So you can't be experts on a single topic. You trust yeah. your staff, et cetera, to inform you. Um, have you been getting that holistic picture? Like, has city council been given that holistic picture or has the information that you all have been given been in and of itself swayed in a particular way? Mm. Um, no, I don't think we have gotten a holistic picture. I think um, to this day, I am surprised when I talk to my colleagues about um, the specifics of, of rent stabilization, you know, including people who voted against the policy. Mm -hmm. And um, and they're surprised to learn that what we were proposing, what I was proposing was not their assumption. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lack of due diligence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, to this day, I'm surprised when, you know, Kira published their um, study on rent stabilization in Minneapolis in, in 20, late 2020, early 2021. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been years now. Mm -hmm. There's been plenty of time to read. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, maybe you're not a big reader. Uh, it was presented to the council actually. So you could just watch and listen. Um, still like there are incorrect conclusions reached about rent stabilization that are disproven by the Kira study. Mm -hmm. It's been, it's been, you know, a thing that's real for, for a number of years again. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I think if you're a person that really cares about understanding a policy and, um, really cares about advancing it, 
you have to go out and do your own research, right? Yeah. That's that's what I did. Um, I I relied on a lot of what's written um, about rent stabilization um, through the Cura study and and the amount of um, studies that it cites. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm through talking to experts that, you know, were a part of the rent stabilization work group, um, through talking to research experts that worked on the Cura study, research experts um, that have worked on um, rent stabilization in other communities around the country, um, because that's, you know, that's my job. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Awesome, thank you for that, really appreciate it. With that, I'm going to keep us moving forward. So as you think about your ward, your constituents in particular, um, what do you see as the next step in this fight? Yeah. Um, I, the beauty of question three is um, the council can take up rent stabilization at any point. Mm -hmm. um, I see... I, I, if I'm reelected by my community, um, I, I will take this issue up again next year. Um, and, um, and I think that Minneapolis residents are interested in rent stabilization. Um, like I think they expect us, um, just speaking from what I hear in Ward 10, mm -hmm. um, and what I hear from colleagues in other parts of the city, they expect us to continue working on a thing they told us to go do. Um, and so it's our responsibility to keep taking on this fight until we um, until we move it to its next phase. Um, but I think one of the misconceptions about rent stabilization, there are many, is that it's a silver bullet, right? Like it's going to be the thing that um, that's supposed to fix everything. And I think critics of rent stabilization oftentimes use that to mm -hmm. say, well, you know, like rent stabilization isn't going to make housing more affordable. Um, mm -hmm. It's not going to increase the supply of housing on its own, you know, things like that. And well, yeah, it's not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there are um, there, we, we are living in a housing crisis. We are living in a displacement crisis. We are living in a homelessness crisis, um, in a scarcity crisis. Yeah. And I, I think rent stabilization is one tool. It's one of the most powerful mm -hmm. in, um, ensuring housing stability in our community. Yes. There are a number of other things we can do, right? Um, whether it's tenant opportunity to purchase, making it easier for people to, um, own, their homes, yeah. making it easier for renters to um, gain access to home ownership, whether it is um, increasing the amount of investment we make in building more affordable yeah. housing, deeply affordable housing um, through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, but also resetting the criteria of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which mm -hmm. right now um, is, is, it favors building um, you know, housing at, at 60% affordable, um, affordability at 60% AMI, um, then it does 30%, which is where the greatest need is. Um, so, so right. the city, um, investing more in building the, the critical housing infrastructure that we need, the critical affordable housing infrastructure that we need, um, strengthening policies like inclusionary zoning, which by the way, Right. Um, when when inclusionary zoning was first proposed, um, developers and and the financial market reacted to it the same way they react to rent stabilization right now. You know, they claimed nobody would ever develop in Minneapolis again. They claimed the sky would fall, and um, and as a result, you know, like Minneapolis would would be in ruins. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen, mm -hmm. but it is um, it is it is a policy that should be strengthened. Um, we should, you know, be talking about how we increase the amount of wages people have, um, increase the amount of food access and transit access people have, um, the weatherization of our homes and decreasing the, um, the like energy bills that people yes. are having to yes. pay, um, strengthening existing, um, tenant protections, um, and, and passing policies like just cause eviction protections mm -hmm. and, um, you know, 60 day noticing notice period, um, and, um, 
and eviction diversion programs like modeled in Philadelphia. Yeah, that's that's really comprehensive. That's a lot of stuff. And I really appreciate it because I do think that people are looking for a silver bullet. People are frustrated. Yeah. Um, I think we're all, I'd like to believe we're all disheartened by the growing number of tent encampments every year and yeah. with our environment um, changing so rapidly, I think that that's, that should be really heavy on everyone's hearts, right? Um, mm -hmm. Thinking about our neighbors who don't have shelter. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And I think it also just demonstrates for our listeners, for your constituents that, you know, you are digging deep into housing yeah. and taking the time to really learn about how do we move forward? You're not simply talking about it. Like yeah. being able to talk about the way that you do demonstrates that it's a true passion of yours. So I appreciate that, um, obviously, as an affordable housing developer. Um, can you share with folks, because you're so informed, you know, folks that are living in other wards where in their mind, they don't have to think about this. They don't have to think mm. about the importance or value of rent stabilization or any of the number of possible solutions that you mentioned. What are the things that are that renters are facing today? Mm. Um, I, I, I like your your mission, right? Like all people having a safe, stable and dignified place to live, I think renters in our community, a lot of them, um, and a lot of them who are Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color, people who are immigrants, people who are young, queer, trans, um, who are struggling with um, with economic stability mm -hmm. um, that that make up our renters, right? Mm -hmm. um, are, are struggling with stability. Um, and that can be everything from, you know, my rent went up by double digits. Mm -hmm. um, that's happening a lot in my community right now. Um, or, um, you know, the, the unit that I am living in, that I've been living in for a number of years, my landlord does not want to renew my lease and I don't know where to go and I don't want to have to leave this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That those are two unique ways that stability can look. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, that safety um, piece, where you know, like just yesterday, um, I you know was working with a constituent who has had black mold in her mm -hmm. unit for um, for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. Her children um, live in in that unit with her, and. Um, or, you know, I like things are broken and I can't get them fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and if I try to, I, I feel like I'm experiencing retaliation um, and dignity in housing, right? Like that, that piece of, um, I feel like I am not welcome here. I feel like I am treated like, um, like a person who's not in their home. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The conditions I'm living in are are not acceptable. You wouldn't want that for you. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so when you were considering, when you were initially considering Framework 5, what about Framework 5 you felt like addressed those issues? Yeah. Um, the the cap at, at 3%, um, I think addressed that that issue of, of stability a lot. Um, I think 3% is a number that, um, that tenants can count on. You know, I think there's, there's a lot of people who are opponents of, of rent control, um, or rent stabilization that will say, you know, there, there are landlords out there that don't raise rent at all. So now you're mandating a 3% increase and, um, and what the, the reality is that, um, while some people experience little increases, um, a lot of people in our community experience severe increases. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, and this is a policy that was built to protect against that and, mm -hmm. and also um, make it so renters know generally, you know, how much they, they should expect to pay. Right. Um, that's what you that's what you get when you buy a mortgage, right? right? Like you know generally how much your housing cost is gonna be for the next 30 years. Right. Um that um, I thought the 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 vacancy control piece mm -hmm. attaching um attaching the cap to the unit um would 
address displacement in our community, right? So um, in my neighborhood, for example, um, Kmart is going to be torn down by the city next year. That entire um, huge block of city-owned property is going to be developed. That means that my neighbors, I am worried about gentrification of my neighborhood, which is one of the last affordable neighborhoods on, um, on the west side of the highway. And I, I think um, preventing the incentive for uh, a landlord or property owner to be able to say, you know, I am going to end this lease. Um, I'm just not going to renew or I'm going to use other tactics to push you out so that I can rent it out at a much higher rate mm -hmm. because I can get it. Um, is, is really scary. And I think this um, vacancy control addresses that. Um, making sure, I thought the capital improvements and deferred maintenance exemption was a really important one, right? A lot of people um, talk to us about living in units that are um, uninhabitable sometimes mm -hmm. um, or are in really poor conditions and um, everybody deserves nice things. Poor people deserve nice things yes. too. Yeah. Um, and um, making sure that there's a mechanism for, for being able to um, do that upkeep on, on all units. Absolutely. That was really important and very well thought out. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so then we are, I, I want to, we're close to the end and the, I, so I have two more questions that I want to ask you. One is, um, a little more of a, a little rumble okay. potentially. All right. And the other one, hopefully we'll, we'll end this on like a nice uplifting note. Um, but so June 28th, coming back to this, um, it was fascinating to look at the, the voting records mm -hmm. for June 28th and look at the previous voting records. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was May 12th, May, May 26th, 26th. 25th. Twenty-five. Okay, May 25th. Um, thank you, Katie Herrick, behind the scenes, <laughs> keeping us on point. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, and a lot of folks actually changed their vote, like folks that said that they would support it moving forward in May and June said no yeah. to putting it on the ballot. Um, and but then also, and of course, you've read the same things that I have read where everyone is like, but if these three council members were there, yeah, then the vote would have passed. Yeah. Um. I, my first thought on June 28th is how dare we hold a vote when we are a responsive, inclusive city and a state where that has one of the largest, largest Muslim populations in the country. Um, how dare we not have more flexibility in our processes? What am I missing where um, folks can't take a reasonable accommodation? It's like, I'm missing a meeting due to something that's really important to me, um, to my faith practice. This is a normal thing in this country. We all have mm -hmm. faith practices, right? Mm -hmm. That we take time off of work for. Um, and so I'd love, I'm, I'm gonna, I have another question, but I'd love first to just ask you, what are we missing about the process? Like what is happening in the system where 10 days out from a vote, um, where the folks that have drafted the policy cannot attend and it's known 10 days out, why can't that be changed? Yeah. Um, you're not missing something about the process. Uh, this, the, the reality is like, this was, this was a political will call. Um, the first Muslim council, there has been a Muslim council member um, on the Minneapolis City Council since 2013. Mm -hmm. um, it's been 10 years. Every single year we have had a Muslim council member on, on this body. Um, this shouldn't be a shocking thing. It happens twice a year, every year for the last 10 years. Right. Um, Muslim residents make up the largest minority in Minneapolis mm -hmm. um, across racial and ethnic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I, 
my first thought um, on June 28th when I like got a text that this had happened um, was like, I just, I felt stupid. Mm -hmm. I felt guilty. Um, I felt like how, you know, it was like, how could I have not seen this coming? Mm -hmm. Um, and see it coming because I expected that my, that the, the people I work with, um, and see every day, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't do such a thing mm -hmm. to me. Um, and to, um, to council members, Ellison and, and Osman, mm -hmm. um, I felt, I think ashamed or, or embarrassed maybe, mm -hmm. um, because like my, my first, like my, I was like, well, why didn't I just show up? You know, like, mm -hmm. why didn't I just, um, why didn't I just choose to not spend that day with my family and instead go to work? Mm -hmm. And, and like, nobody would, I've never, I've never expected that of someone on Christmas. I've never worked a Christmas in my life. Um, because, um, the majority of my colleagues always in every workplace I've ever been in always need that day off. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and if something has come up, like I've just taken it on, um, because why would I ask my coworkers to give up a day that is for their family? Um, and I thought that courtesy would be reciprocated. Um, I think there was, um, you know, there's like a lot of, a lot of back and forth on like whether it was possible to cancel the meeting. Um, and the untold story here is it, it doesn't take three days to cancel a meeting. We've actually canceled plenty of meetings because of unexpected snowstorms um, and uh, and like just life emergencies, mm -hmm. unexpected emergencies that come up. Mm -hmm. um, the three day notice is required to set a new meeting, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so what what our leadership could have chosen to do is, is cancel the meeting and reschedule it for Friday or reschedule it for the following Monday or sometime in the following week. But the following week was what we call award week. We didn't have um, we didn't have committees scheduled. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people were planning on going out of town. And uh, and some of them were planning on leaving town a little early. Mm. Um, and it was the, con it was, it, the choice was like, are we going to move forward with this meeting, even though these three can't be here, or are we going to try to reschedule? And, you know, some members might be upset because they, um, they're going to have to move like their travel plans or, around, or it's going to inconvenience them on a week that they expected to have off. Mm. Right. So like the same courtesy, mm -hmm. um, was, was misapplied, I guess. Right. Um, and, and then the, the last piece on this, mm -hmm. and I will, I will wrap up. Um, we, d we weren't voting to put policy on the ballot on June 28th. It was a procedural vote. We were voting to send it to committee, mm -hmm. um, where we could, amend the policy, we could hold a public hearing on it, we could um, work on it, we could do the actual work on it. Um, that's what we voted against, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This wasn't a finalized product. Mm -hmm. It was it was a procedural vote. Mm -hmm. We vote to send things to committee unanimously all of the time, all of the time. Mm -hmm. I've only ever seen one vote like this fail. And it was authored by council member Wansley. Mm. Do you mind telling us what, what that was? Um, it was uh, to do a temporary prohibition um, on encampment evictions. Um, housing related, mm -hmm. stability related. Um, that's really, it says a lot. Thank you for just like recapping that for us. Um, and bringing us who are not in, in the room into the room. Um, I did say that this would feel, this would have a little rumble to it. <laughs> so I'm going to um, just, just raise something that I know your, your colleagues have raised and, and give you a chance to, to speak on it. Mm -hmm. 
you know, as an elected official, you're asked to make sacrifices mm -hmm. all the time uh, for the people. And, and this was a really important vote. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to, even, even in the injustice of what happened, why you weren't willing to prioritize it? Mm -hmm. I do make sacrifices all of the time. Um, I do choose my my work. Um, I do choose ser like serving my constituents. Um, I choose my work out of service to my constituents over my family all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, my my brother is twelve. He's mm -hmm. um, he's starting his second year of middle school um, in a couple weeks. Um, I. I see him once every couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, I, and and like, I, I, I'm not complaining about that. I really am not. I, like I chose, I campaigned for this job. I asked for it. I'm proud to serve my community. Mm -hmm. um, this wasn't, this was a procedural vote. It was a technical vote. Um, I I think it's weird that we chose to that the, the the colleagues who were in the room chose to make it into something it wasn't. Um and then and then are doing what I would call gaslighting, right? Um when like they could have chosen to move the meeting, right? They could have chosen to postpone the item. Could come back to it in two weeks. But like Thank you for that. Um, so I will just say that from an outside perspective, um, you know, June 28th felt um, like it had a malicious intention to it. Yeah. Um, particularly given, um, again, going back to the voting record and just seeing people change their vote um, on a day when, again, three members of city council who were proponents of moving this forward were not able to be in the room. And when the two authors were not able to be in the room. Um, and I think it's just, I know I'm not the only person that feels that way. So it's important to like ask these questions and help us as constituents of the city voters understand what's, what is happening behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, so thank you for going there. Uh, my last question is meant to be um, exciting and give you an opportunity to kind of talk about uh, your uh, your campaign and just like what do you see? So so obviously rent stabilization is not on the ballot this year. You spoke earlier to continuing to push it if you are elected um, for twenty twenty five. In the meantime, though. What is your vision for your ward for housing justice for your ward? Yeah. Um I I I dream of uh Minneapolis and like of a of a ward 10 um where everyone in our community can thrive. Um where we can experience stability, where we can experience dignity, where we can experience safety, um, and where we can experience resilience. Um, and I, I think in the face of all that has happened on rent stabilization over this this last year and a half um and and all that we have left to do on it mm -hmm. um the book is not closed on this issue mm -hmm. it won't be for a while mm -hmm. um i am you know like excited to be working on tenant opportunity to purchase this year mm -hmm. i'm excited to be um working to bring resources into my community and um you know, expanding relocation assistance through our budget process this year. Um, there is, there is so 
much work that we can do at any given moment on making people's lives easier. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Really exciting, powerful vision. Uh, um, reminder to those of you listening that this is an election year. We will keep saying it a million times because we believe that regardless of how you vote, it's important that you do it. Um, show up, participate in the process. We cannot complain if we don't show up, y'all. So Tuesday, November 7th, all of the city council seats are up for election this year. This is very exciting. Um, we get to shape the entire um, the entire council. Um, we use ranked choice voting just as a reminder, which means that you can rank up to three candidates for each office. Uh, we will have links in our show notes for your ward number and your current representative, as well as those that are running to challenge that representative. Um, so please show up, pay attention, read all the things. Uh, Aisha said it very well. If you, if it's important to you, it's important that you do the work to learn the things that you need to know to make the best decision. Um, Aisha, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. It was awesome to talk to you and even just to like get to hang with a city council member that really knows housing justice. It's pretty dope. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, really good time. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Um, last couple of announcements. We're having a housing justice forum next Tuesday, August 29th, uh, 6 p.m. on Zoom. And this is an opportunity for you our, our neighbors, our followers, those of you passionate about housing justice to get to talk to the city council members directly. Ask the hard questions, make the challenging statements and points of accountability to them. We are their bosses. So let's let them know now what we're looking for um, after November 7th. And I'm really excited to just share that Council member Chuck Tai will also be there on August 29th. So if anything you heard today, you're like, I have questions about that, or I don't know how I feel about that. Come on August 29th and ask her to explain. Um, please continue to follow um, and uh, register to attend. The link for that will also be in our show notes. This is what we do here. We love it. Um, if you're not already following us on social media, please do so. You can at Urban Homeworks on all of the platforms, Twitter, aka X. What is that? I don't know. <laughs> um, but that tweeting social media platform, Facebook, <laughs> Instagram, uh, and even LinkedIn for you Gen Xers. We are all <laughs> over. Um, our annual fundraiser, Perpetuate the Hope, is coming up on Thursday, October 12th. We're very excited. We have an incredible lineup, so we'd love to see you come hang out with these really amazing uh, Minneapolis-based artists um, like Noor D, Black Impro Blackout Improv, and Kevin Yang, spoken word artist. Um, it's an opportunity to learn more about our work. Um, and so come on through to our website at urbanhomeworks.org forward slash event forward slash PTH dash 2023. My team is going to make that easier for me to say in the future because it's a mouthful. Um, but other than that, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, we love the conversations with you all. So stay active. Thank you so much for tuning in to Reclaiming Home, Housing Justice with Urban Homeworks for today's discussion. If you like this podcast and want to support Urban Homeworks housing work, head over to www.urbanhomeworks.org forward slash donate to make a gift, attend a future event, volunteer with us, or learn more. Until next time, remain connected and informed 